Being in this auditorium reminds me of one of the most embarrassing moments I ever had in my life. I was invited to do a high school graduation here, and uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I just came with an Aloha shirt and just kind of really casually dressed, and everybody else, the principal, the teachers, all the parents, everybody's all decked out with a suit and tie, and man, was I embarrassed, and I was the main speaker, so that was a bummer. And then the other time I was here, I dropped all of my books in front of everybody, and uh, Just taking a glass of water reminds me of my biggest, most embarrassing moment. I was at a church in California, and uh, to make a long story short, I had a couple of cups of tea this one morning, and I had just flown in, preached the first service, and then I wanted to run to the pastor's house to get some notes for the second service, and I got out there, and I got stuck on the freeway, got in a traffic jam, so I had to run back to the church. I abandoned all hope of getting the notes. I got to the church. The church service was packed for the second service and I had to park about three or four blocks away. I got out of my car and I'm running, you know, I'm the guest speaker and I'm all embarrassed because I'm 20 minutes late. I get back to the church, bust in the back door. The worship team is on their last song. So I go, praise God, at least I'm not late. So I went in, I walked up, sat in the front row and all of a sudden I realized, man, I got to go shishi big time. (laughs) And, um, and I'm right there, and, and I, I figure, well, I got about two minutes. I can run back out and try to, well, that's going to be kind of embarrassing. I just ran in, and then I made the fatal decision that I'm going to hold it. And uh, I got up to the pulpit. I'm there, and I'm looking at the clock, and I got a 45-minute message, and I'm there. I'm about five or ten minutes into the message, and I said, this, this ain't happening. So I said to the church, I said, I said, you know, folks, I've preached in hundreds of churches before, and um, I have never done this in my life, and you've probably heard hundreds of sermons. You've, you've never seen anybody do this. But I got to go shishi, and uh, I got to go to the bathroom. So I walked down, walked straight out the front, uh, straight out the middle aisle, and walked to the back. The pastor's having a cap on the front row. He's never seen this happen before. So he gets up and starts tuning his guitar. And while he's tuning his guitar, I go in the back, and I forgot I had one of these lapel mics on when I went into the bathroom. And uh, and I'm ooh ah yeah, you know, I'm feeling really good. And, Assistant pastor comes running in the door, busts open the door and says, you got your mic on. I went, oh, and things got from bad to worse after that. <laughs> so then when I came in the, back in the church, I'm walking down the middle aisle. I got a standing ovation from the church. It was great. I was thanking everybody as I came down the aisle. I got up to preach and I said, well, this might not be the most anointed sermon you've ever heard, but you'll never forget it. And so uh, it was a great time. So I'm not going to drink too much water today. It's got me paranoid ever since then. Uh, and I will be really careful with my music stand. Okay, Psalm 16. Uh, Psalm 16, verse 11. We're going to do something a little different today. We're going to go slightly backwards because we want to be going for uh, an ultimate objective. I was uh, uh, driving down the street in, um, in my neighborhood not long ago, and uh, about a month and a half ago, and I turned on the radio, and Pastor Mike Kai from Hope Chapel West Oahu was on. And he used this phrase and he called it redemptive potential. Say redemptive potential. Redemptive potential is there's a certain, because God has redeemed us, there's a certain potential that we have. Uh, right now, uh, basketball playoffs are on, and, and so everybody wants the players to be playing up to their potential. And sometimes uh, one player can get inside of another player's head, and it messes him up, and he can't play to his potential. Your potential is what you can achieve with what God has given you. And that could be individually, or it can be corporately. Uh, when I first became a Christian, and somebody told me God had a plan for my life, I said, hey, if I can just stay saved, if I, I'm just part of the white knuckle club, you know, if I can just hang on, I'll be happy. I don't, I don't want to know about any plan for my life or God's going to do anything for me. I'll be just happy if I can stay saved and stay off of drugs and alcohol. And now fast forward the, the video and, and here I am and, and uh, I have been able to step into uh, what the Hawaiians call my kuleana, my area of responsibility. And God saved you for you being able to reach as much of your redemptive potential as you can possibly reach. And uh, none of us are going to hit it 100% because none of us are perfect. But I've been a Christian for a long time now, and it's been my privilege. I just got back from Fiji, and uh, I helped start YWAM in Fiji about uh, 25 or 30 years ago. And uh, now to see the potential, and they've taken some, some hits. There's been some real problems down there. But some people have stepped up to the plate, and they said, uh, you know, they, they kind of volunteered when they heard a call like we heard this morning, and they stepped up to the plate. Now we've got about 67 Fijian missionaries around the world, and, and um, they're going for their redemptive potential. 
And, but on the other hand, I've seen people who have missed their redemptive potential. Uh, um, Miles McPherson, who some of you know, he's a, a former San Diego Chargers uh, cornerback. And uh, he's coming to speak here out in West Oahu in a couple of months. And uh, Miles is an old friend of mine. But one day I was on Hotel Street in Chinatown, and I'm witnessing to this guy. He's kind of a, a thin, frail-looking guy that's got an open container. He's obviously uh, had some problems with alcohol, just got booted out of a rehab program. And so I just sat down with this guy. He's a, a maybe 5'11", 6-foot African-American guy. And I was talking, now, what's your story, bro? And he tells me his story, and he tells me he was on the San Diego Chargers one time. And, and I'll just be honest with you, I didn't believe him because he didn't look like a football player and certainly didn't look like a football player now, but he was a little older and so on. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I'm watching Monday Night Football and uh, there's an interception that runs back for 95 yards and the announcer on Monday Night Football says, oh, well, uh, that's not the record here. Back in 1978, here is the record for the interception Monday Night Football. And he gave the guy's name, intercepted the ball on a 99-yard line, ran 99 yards for an interception touchdown and it was blankety blank. And he gave the guy's name. So I went back down to Chinatown. I said, bro, I saw you on Monday Night Football the other night. You're a hero. He said, well, I told you I played for the Chargers. I said, oh, yeah. I, I didn't believe you, you know. But, but what I saw in that guy as he was struggling again and again and again with alcohol and drug abuse and this and that, and he just couldn't come up. And he had accepted Jesus ten times and fallen away ten times. And it, was just, it just broke my heart to see here's a guy who had redemptive potential. And then I see a guy like Miles McPherson who gets saved and just takes off like a rocket ship for God. He's got a church of several thousand. They're rocket nations for Jesus. And then you think of a, of a, of a one guy like a waxer Tipton and he's trying to reach his redemptive potential and then he's trying to impart it to you. And now we have this awesome redemptive potential we have. This church can touch the world for Christ. We can send missionaries to every continent. We can reach out to Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and plant churches in the Middle East and Africa and Asia and Latin America and uh, see tremendous strides for God. We can impact the whole Islands. We can see things happen. We can change things. But people who fight for their liberties don't change the world. It's people who give up their rights and take their responsibilities and say, you know, I've only got one life to live and I'm going to live it for Jesus and I'm going to try to reach my redemptive potential. Say to your neighbor and say, hey, this is going to be good. Hang in there. All right. <laughs> Psalm 16, verse 11. Now, this is, this is what it's all about. You have made known to me the path of life. How many of you have had made known to you the path of life? Okay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. How many of you want joy in God's presence? With eternal pleasures at your right hand. One of the songs we sang said something like that. Eternal pleasures at your right hand. So... This seems to indicate at the end of the psalm that there is a, there's a, a life of stoke. There is an eternal life, but an eternal life here. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. The Greeks had two words for life. One was bios, in which we get our word biology. That just means to exist. A tree can exist and live. But then there's the word zoe. And zoe has to do with a, with a quality of life, with something that, man, I'm, I'm ha not only happy to be alive, I'm happy to be plugged in with the life of the vine, which is Jesus. And I'm going to serve Jesus with all my heart. And as uh, the worship leader just said, uh, hey, we can't help but worship God. Now, before we go on, I want to ask a really spiritual question. Gird up the loins of your mind. It's going to be tough. Very spiritual. How many of you are for the Lakers in the playoffs? Okay, hands down. How many of you for the Celtics in the playoffs? How many of you couldn't care one way or another? Oh. Jesus for president. Who cares, right? But, but this is what it's all about, see? Now, now just think. Uh, uh, the playoffs right now are in Boston. So let's say the uh, Boston Police Department are at the door of the auditorium, and they're giving out $50 vouchers to all the Celtics fans, and they're saying, look... You can hand this in. We're going to have video cameras all over the auditorium uh, looking at all uh, 20,000 fans. And you can hand in this $50 voucher if you can keep your mouth shut and not say a word or make a noise the whole game. We'll give you 50 bucks. How many of you know nobody would be able to collect the 50 bucks? 
Either, whatever side you're on. Because there's something about when a Paul Pierce makes a three-pointer or when a Rondo makes a layup or back to L.A. if you're an L.A. fan, when uh, Kobe makes a three-pointer or when Pau Gasol blocks a shot or something like that happens. There's something within you that has to praise your team because they are the object of your affection. You can't keep quiet in a basketball game. Just like when we love God, we cannot shut up when it comes to Jesus, either worshiping God in praise vertically or telling people about Jesus horizontally because we've got something that's happened inside of us. And that's what I want to call your inheritance. So the title of our message today is Possessing Your Inheritance. Now, write down, uh, before we get into the scriptures, a couple of definitions. A possession is what you have. Uh, I possess this Bible. It's my Bible. Uh, it's a possession that I have. An inheritance is what I have that is promised to me. So if you look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 8, this is my favorite verse on missions, and it's, uh, it's actually in context. It's God the Father talking to God the Son. And He says, Ask of me, and I will make the nations... This is where we have to lift up our eyes and say, it's not all about Oahu, it's not all about Hawaii, it's not all about the U.S., it's about the nations of the earth, that God wants us to reach nations and disciple nations. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. So God has given the Son, God the Father has given God the Son a promise that I want you to inherit the nations. And an inheritance is something that you receive coming down from your forefathers. Um, and um, what we find here in this passage is some scriptures that have to do with inheritance. Now, we don't have time to go through all the verses, but if you can jump to um, uh, Psalm 16, verse 5. And this will be, uh, you, it's on your notes if you don't have your Bible, right there under point one. And I'm going to read this verse, and then I'm going to put certain emphasis on certain syllables uh, so I can make a point. Psalm 16. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. Now, in this psalm, if you want to count it, if you go through the 11 verses, there are 27 personal pronouns in the psalm, which is that uh, a personal pronoun is I, me, and mine. And so there's a corporate emphasis on the message, but there's also individual. And David is looking at this and he's saying, you know, I have uh, an inheritance. It's my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. Now, let me unpack this a little bit for you. In the context here, David is using language that all the Jewish people... Now, you know the Psalms, is a, it's like a Jewish hymn book, and this is what they would sing. And like Mark, I'm not going to sing for you today. By the way, wasn't it great to see the choir up here today? That was awesome. You know, you know what's really cool? I was thinking, in the old days, like back in the 50s and 60s, before churches like this started to, you know, in auditoriums where you had electric guitars and we got a little bit more free, all churches would have, you know, organs and choirs and things like that. Then we came along and we changed it all and then we didn't have choirs anymore. But how many of you know, uh, some churches are just too cool to have a choir. But how many of you know if you're free, you can have a choir or you cannot have a choir? And it's better to be free than it is to be cool. And God hasn't called us to be cool, God's called us to be free. So I say if people can sing in a choir, God bless you and keep on releasing your choir to sing. Now, you wouldn't want to bring me into the choir unless you had a bunch of demons who who you wanted to scatter. Because (laughs) as soon as I start to sing, the demons go, ah, and then they run out the door. So language in the Jewish hymn book is they understood that this is language that has to do with the boundary lines that were established to the children of Israel when the land was divided. And you can look at this in Joshua's chapters 13 to 21. Now, also the language is, uh, you have assigned me my portion and my cup, and you've made my lot secure. The word lot is, is literally a lot. It's a plot of land. 
And you've given me my cup, which is my uh, provision from you, my portion as opposed to other people's portions. And they have portions and I have a portion and you have assigned it to me. So God has assigned us. If we can see the language of land, God has assigned us our land in the Hawaiian. Of course, the word is Aina. And many cultures of the world, and one of the brothers was praying about, the, about Israel early this morning. And we've all got an assignment of land that God has given us. Now, you may not have any physical land to be your kuleana or your responsibility here on the earth, but you've been given a spiritual inheritance. And so he says, the boundary lines have fallen for me. So the language is, God drops the boundary lines from heaven. And God is the one who drops the lines and the lines fall. And wherever the lines fall, that's your inheritance. That's your kuleana. That's your responsibility. And David basically said, hey, I'm happy with my boundary lines. My boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And you know what? I'm stoked at my inheritance. Now, um, there's something about being stoked at your inheritance. Now, let me give you a a couple of Bible verses. I believe that God's will. Now, I'm not one of these guys that believes that if you fall down the steps and crack your head, you're supposed to go, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and put some phony baloney smile on your face as if you had the joy of the Lord. But I do believe in the following scriptures. You can write these down. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do your will. When you see the word delight in the Bible, that is, I find joy. In your will. I delight to do your will. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Uh, I was looking at Waxer's website last night because I forgot to tell you the truth what time the service was this morning. That would have been embarrassing. <laughs> Came in at 10.30. Hey, where is everybody? They're gone, Danny. But uh, on the website last night, it, it, was, it had a little funny thing. Uh, about Waxer, and it says that all of his ministry assignments have been in surf spots, whether it was San Diego or Santa Barbara or Oahu or Molokai, and you know, and he said, do we doubt that God gives us the desires of our heart? Now, if I was Waxer, I wouldn't be embarrassed about that. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. As St. Augustine said, love God with all your heart and do what you want to do. God can trust you to do what you want to do if you surrender everything to Jesus in the first place. So there's something about a stoke. In um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it says the joy of the Lord is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says the joy of the Lord is your strength. And in Jeremiah 15, 16, it's a cool verse. It says, I found your words and I did eat them And they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Just this morning, I've got my, uh, I've got Bible memorization verses uh, that I've memorized and I laminate them. And I was driving down the street today and I was going through the book of Romans, which I memorized back in 1988 and 89. And so I go over that. I'm just driving down the freeway, man. the, The traffic doesn't bother me because I'm memorizing Romans. And it's the joy and rejoicing of my heart. And so that's where God wants to bring us is to a place uh, where we have the joy of the Lord. There's a verse in Psalm 100, verse 2, that says this. Serve the Lord with gladness. Now hang on to this. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I'm going to prophesy to you now. Thus says the Lord. God wants you to serve Him. But there's a difference between serving the Lord with gladness and just serving the Lord. And... If you do not break through to be able to serve the Lord with gladness, pretty soon you'll probably stop serving the Lord. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. Prophecy number two. If I was the devil, which I'm not, by the way. (laughs) But if I was the devil, I would do everything I can to rip you off for your joy. I would love to steal your joy. Why? Because your joy is what gives you the strength to be able to serve Him. Serve the Lord with gladness. So back to this verse here, if we could have Psalm uh, 16, verse 5 up here again, about I have a delightful inheritance. My boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Now, let me just use myself for an illustration. Uh, I obviously am an author. I've written a couple of books. I've got two other books in the hopper right now. I am an author. Rick Warren is also an author. I have a certain kuleana and boundary lines that God has dropped for me. 
Rick Warren has boundary lines that God has dropped for him. I want to tell you a little story. It'll let you in on the devious little nature of my little wicked heart here. And, um, but don't laugh too loud because you have that same heart in you. Um, about five years ago, Rick Warren had this book called The Purpose Driven Life, and it had sold 25 million copies. And um, then something happened, a, a real unfortunate incident happened at a courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, in which an inmate had overpowered his guard, killed the lady that was guarding him, broke away from his handcuffs, went in and killed the judge that was going to try his case, killed a police officer, ran out, stole a police car, and drove away. He had already killed three people. It was a massive dragnet all over the Atlanta area, and everybody knew this guy was on the loose. Fear was and terror was in the hearts of everybody in Atlanta and in the surrounding area. And there was this lady uh, who came into her house and sees the guy sitting in her living room. So he pulls her over and he's got his gun and she knows this guy's killed other people. She figures, well, it's just going to be a matter of time before he kills me. So she sits there all nervous and, uh, and he's talking to her and pa- time passes about two hours and she says, well, are you hungry? And uh, he says, yeah. And she says, would you like some pancakes? And he says, okay. So she goes, makes him some pancakes. They eat together. They start having a little bit of a uh, storytelling, like talking story interaction here. And then they're sitting there for another hour or two. And of course, sirens are everywhere and everybody's looking for the guy. And then she says, you know, I'm reading this book. It's on my book stand. Could I show it to you? And she goes over and gets this book. And she says, it's called The Purpose Driven Life. And uh, I read a chapter a day for 40 days. And today I'm on... Uh, you know, number 10, and it's uh, God has a purpose for your life. Can I read it to you? He says, yeah, yeah, go ahead, read it to me. So she reads the word of God out of this book, and the guy ends up, long story short, he surrenders to the authorities, and today he's in prison. But uh, uh, God used Rick's book to be able to help, you know, do a miracle. And when I read that account, the first thing that went through my mind was not, praise the Lord, God bless Rick Warren for his book. First thing that went through my mind was looking over my boundary lines and going, he already sold 25 million. I didn't even sell 25,000 yet. <laughs> Why wasn't she reading one of my books? And I got on Larry King. And Larry King could ask me about my book. And I could say, well, yes, Larry. I and I could sell a couple of million copies. How come? Now, you're laughing because you would go through the same thing, right? <laughs> because we're just not content with the boundary lines that God has given us. And that's the problems with Greg Laurie one day. Now, Greg is an evangelist by the grace of God, and I'm an evangelist by the grace of God. My boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places, and so is Greg's. I'm with Greg one day, and I said, Greg, I heard Billy Graham said you are his favorite preacher. I said, if Billy Graham said I was his favorite preacher, I'd probably start a Danny Lehman magazine or something, you know? I mean, you know, how do you handle Billy Graham saying you're the greatest preacher in the world? And, you know, Greg said, oh, well, you know, the Calvary guys keep me humble in God. And uh, we just had a little... So I could, if I'm not careful, look over my boundary lines at Greg's boundary lines, or I could look over my boundary lines at Rick Warren's Kuleana, and I could be not happy that my boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. And the bottom line comes oftentimes when we get jealous of other people and we say, and we blame other people and this, and how come I'm not the worship leader? I can sing better than that guy. How come I'm not over the Sunday school super? How, How come? Well, maybe God has not dropped those boundary lines where you want him to be drawn. And here's the question. Is that okay with you? Is, is, have your boundary lines fallen in pleasant places? Are you okay, Danny, to sell 25,000 books and rejoice that Rick Warren has now sold 32 million? <laughs> yes, I am happy for Rick Warren. <laughs> now, but that's the problem with a lot of us is that we are not simply faithful. So fill in the blanks. Be faithful to your assignment. One of the ways to possess your inheritance is to be faithful uh, to the assignment that God has given you. There's a verse in the Proverbs that says, Many a man will speak of his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find? Who can just be faithful? The great American philosopher Woody Allen once said, 95% of success is showing up. It's just showing up. I remember uh, I was talking to one of our young guys about criticism, and and he said, you ever been criticized, Danny? I said, I've been criticized my whole ministry. There's always somebody out there that's going to criticize you. And now with the websites, man, you know, everybody's fair game, from Billy Graham all the way across the line. If you've got a website, you can blast anybody you want and criticize like crazy. And I said, oh, yeah, I've gotten criticized a lot. And I said, but you know what? 
they might have been right in their criticisms, but I tell you what, I'm still here. If nothing else, I'm still here. I haven't backslid. I'm still walking with Jesus. I got a wife and two boys that are walking with God. If I haven't done anything else, I'm still here. And I want to encourage you to just simply be faithful with what God has given you. Scripture says, be faithful in that which is little and I'll make you ruler over much. Be faithful in the natural, I'll make you ruler over the spiritual. Be faithful in that which is somebody else's and I'll make you ruler over your own. Kuliana and your own responsibility. Uh, I'm writing a book right now called The Next Big Thing. And uh, in this particular book, The Next Big Thing, this is the point, is that whatever God gives you to do, whether it's Greg Laurie preaching to 50,000 people at a, at a stadium at a Harvest Crusade, or whether it's earlier in Greg Laurie's life, when as a 19-year-old convert, he went to Pastor Chuck Smith, and he said, Pastor, uh, I'm here, and I can serve, and I can teach Bible studies, and I can preach on the streets, and I can do this and that. How can I serve you? And Chuck said, well, you know, we still got some fellows in our church that are still smoking, and they drop their cigarette butts on the parking lot. Why don't you go out on the parking lot and pick up cigarette butts? And Greg said, Amen. And he went out and started picking up cigarette butts. That was the next big thing. Maybe that has a connection with what he's doing now. But what if God chose to take somebody picking up cigarette butts and he gave them a very small kuleana? Is that okay with you? I was talking to one of our young guys uh, a couple years ago uh, in YWAM and he came to me as a staff guy and he said, Danny... I'm dry on the inside. Matter of fact, your first song that you sang says, This is my prayer in the desert when all that is in me runs dry. Anybody ever had that experience? We're going to talk about that in a minute. But he says, I'm dry. I don't get excited in the worship times. My Bible reads like it's a dead book. I don't get affirmation and excitement from God when I serve him. I'm just kind of feeling dead and dry and empty on the inside. And I don't have nothing to give to anybody else. And so I'm going to quit. And so I did a little fishing around, you know, is there any kind of a, a little darkness here? Maybe there's a little sin, you know, no sin in his life, no problem that I could diagnose. And I said, bro, let me tell you what I think ha- is happening. I think that you're involved in what one particular uh, writer, a 13th century Carmelite monk named John of the Cross in a book called The Dark Night of the Soul, in which God designs a darkness so that when you walk through that darkness, you don't forget in the darkness what you learned in the light. Now, we're going to come back to that in a second. But what I encouraged the guy to do, I said, bro, did God tell you to make a commitment to the school? He said, yes. I said, did God tell you to break your commitment? He said, no, I'm just dry. I said, okay, that's the point. Be faithful to the commitment that you've made, whether you feel like it or not. Now, we'll come back to that in just a second, but... uh, Getting back to this um, next big thing, uh, in my research for my book, and this was my point, and far, part of it came out of my own testimony of wanting to be a big, whatever, preacher or author or whatever, and being content with what God's given me. Because somebody else could have a kuleana and look over into my boundary lines and say, oh, I want to be like Danny Lehman. He's written three or four books and he's this, this, and that. If you do that, it's a lose-lose situation all the way around. You feel insignificant and condemned if you look at Rick Warren you feel proud and arrogant if you look at the other guy so be happy and content with the boundary lines that God has dropped in your life whether it's ministry or job or family or whatever your job is to be faithful God's job is to give the blessings and he says if we're faithful he'll give the blessings but um, in my research I was looking up uh, a, a phenomena that in science they now call the butterfly effect there's been movies about this, and we've had uh, everything from, uh, uh, from um, what's the name of that book, with, or that movie with Michael J. Fox? Back to the Future, you know, stuff like that, in which little choices and little happenings and little variables can have big effects. And the, re- the, way, the way the butterfly effect first came out, in 1961, there was a scientist slash meteorologist by the name of um, Edward Lorenz. And this was the days when computers were big and very slow moving. And he was given the assignment to punch in some numbers to try to predict what kind of a weather pattern would come out if such and such a variable came into the weather uh, scenario. 
And so because computers are so slow, uh, he punched in uh, the, the number 00.0561 and he said, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. So he went over to get the cup of coffee and he comes back before he's able to put the other three numbers, 064. He didn't put them in and the computer had already started to tabulate and he just let it go. And he discovered that the, the result was an absolutely, totally different scenario. And that's where they got the saying that a butterfly can flap its wings in Tasmania and that can be the variable for a tornado going off in Texas. And it's actually, it's actually a valid scientific observation. And it just goes to show of how little things can make such a big difference. I'm sitting on a beach in California and somebody walks up to me. In fact, uh, just the other day I, I discovered this guy on Facebook and thanked him because he was the publisher of a newspaper called the Hollywood Free Paper, which went out in the 70s during the Jesus movement. I'm sitting on the beach. Somebody walks up and gives me that paper. That paper cost that guy about 15 cents. He spent about five minutes with me. And as I read the paper, it had a small article by a 15-year-old surfer girl named Margot Godfrey, who to this day lives on Kauai. And Margot's testimony of how she came to Jesus as the woman's world surfing champion really spoke to me. And through a couple of other variables, I ended up coming to Jesus. Now, 15 cents, five minutes, maybe an hour of Margot's time, and a publisher who got an idea to put out a book. All of those little variables contributed to me coming to know Jesus. And so my point is, be faithful with what God has given you, and you never know what the Lord's going to do. I was down on Hotel Street a couple of years ago and uh, I was leading a street outreach team and I told everybody, be back at the van at midnight, we'll go back home. And um, I was the, the leader and the driver of the van and here, lo and behold, I'm 15 minutes late. So I'm feeling really bad. I'm walking up the street really quick. I walk by the Hubba Hubba Club and there's a couple of um, um, sailors coming out of the club and I gave them three tracks and ran to the ran to the van and apologized to my friends and then gave them a ride back to Manoa. A couple of weeks later, one of those guys shows up with the track in his hand. I had the good sense to stamp the the, uh, address of the church on the back. Ended up becoming a Christian that day. His wife got saved. His kids got saved. All because I took one second to to pass out a track. And he said, he says, I think you gave this to me a couple weeks ago. I said, I don't remember. He says, yeah, you were moving so fast. I don't blame me for not remembering. (laughs) But it was a little thing. But I was faithful to give out that little tract. And so little things have big consequences. Now let's jump back into the second point, which is be diligent in the darkness. Be diligent in the darkness. Let's go to the next verse, Psalm 16, verse 7. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Hang on to this. Even in the night seasons, my heart instructs me. Even in the night seasons. Now let's go back to this dark night of the soul thing. The dark night of the soul is a period of, uh, it's a desert experience. It's when you subjectively can't feel God. Now put your hand up if you have ever gone through that experience. For five minutes, five years or whatever, most everybody. Uh, The rest of them are need to be a little more honest. So, we have all gone through this dark night of the soul. Not me, Brandy. I'm on on a spiritual stoke. I'm on a high 100% of the time. With all due respect, baloney. Because we all go through our dark times. Some of us go through darker times than others. Now, if you are going through a desert experience right now, and you're next to a person who's a, oh, happy day, happy day, I don't feel like it's a happy day. It's not a happy day to me, man. I mean, you guys think it's a happy day. I don't think it's a happy day. It's the same day as I walked in here before they started singing that goofy song as before I walked out on the parking lot. It is not a happy day. If you were living my life, you wouldn't be singing about a happy day, brother. Life sucks and that's just the way it is. But you know what? You're in good company. David said in Psalm 109, Oh God, please break your silence. Psalm 42, God, why have you forgotten me? Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Does that sound familiar? Jesus Christ on the cross felt the darkness of God. Um, 
Second Chronicles 32:31 says, "God left Hezekiah." What does it mean to leave somebody? Well, whatever it is, it ain't good. <laughs> they're either with me or they're gone, and it says God was with Hezekiah, and God left him to prove and test what was in his heart. Abraham, of course, had been uh, tested. At least 58 psalms. There's only 150 psalms, but at least 58 of them are what we call psalms of lament. Where, oh God, where are you? I'm trying to do what's right, and the wicked people get all the cream, and I get all the junk, and how come? And, I'm, and lamenting, and, and hard times that they were going through. Now, let me give you a really interesting scripture. Psalm 50, verse 10. I want to slow down and uh, unpack this a little bit. Psalm 50, verse 10. This would be uh, the next one. Yeah. Who among you... Well, well, first of all, let me preface this. If you've ever read the book of John or the book of 1 John, you will see that darkness is bad and light is good. Everybody with me on that? Okay. Whosoever walks in the darkness is a liar and the truth is not in him. Walk in the light while you have the light. Do not walk in the darkness. There's the prince of darkness, the powers of darkness. So darkness is bad. Light is good in the writings of John. But in this context, it's a little bit switched. It says, who among you fears the Lord? Now, how many of you God fears do we have? Got a lot of God fears? Good. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the word of his servant? That should be a, a servant, a singular. Because the servant of the Lord in the latter chapters of Isaiah is a prophetic picture of Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying is, who among you fears God and obeys Jesus? And I think that would be most of us here. We fear God and obey Jesus. So we're talking good people. Let him who walks in the dark, who has no light, trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Hmm. So they're walking in the light, right? They're they're walking in the fear of the Lord and obeying Jesus, according to John. But Isaiah says, let him who is walking in the fear of the Lord and obeying God, but also is walking in the darkness and doesn't have any light, let him trust in the name of the Lord. Now, I said it earlier. I'm going to say it again for emphasis. And that is that God will tailor and will create and will form a tunnel specifically for you because he wants you to walk through the darkness of that tunnel so you can learn to walk by faith. And you might think, hey, what's God doing? Jacking me around here? And how come I've been good to God? And how come this calamity happened to me? And I was serving the Lord and I got ripped off and I got the test of injustice and I did something good and I got the... How come? And it's okay. Relax. Because God doesn't want you to forget in the darkness what you learn in the light. Why? Because His main number one objective in your life is to help you to walk by faith. For we walk by faith faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him, Hebrews eleven six, And it's by faith that we overcome the world, 1 John 5, 4. So God's all about faith. But faith, by definition, Hebrews 11, 1, is the substance of things we hope for and the evidence of things we cannot see. So God wants you to be able to walk with a God that you cannot see in circumstances in which you cannot see where you are going. Why does he do that? Because he wants to jack you around? No, because if you walk by sight all the time, you'll never grow by faith. And this is what was happening with my young friend as he's saying, hey, I want to feel God. I want to experience God. I want to be wild at heart. I want to experience the purpose driven life. Uh, I want to have my best life now. I want to pray the prayer of Jabez. And in 30 days, I want my life to be totally perfect. And I'm not knocking those books. I'm just saying they only tell one side of the story. And authors like me like to come up with, if you do these six principles, you'll have a great life. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in this particular context, you're going to have some darkness in your life and nobody escapes it, including the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even Jesus said that. But it was because God was doing it. And it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, a very interesting verse, that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. How does Jesus learn anything? He's he's God. Well, when he was on the earth, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. 
Let me jump to another verse here. There was a, something that happened in Paul the Apostle's life. You've got to trust me on this. I don't have time to go into it. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. First six verses, Paul the Apostle is whoo, whoop, beamed up into heaven and he sees incredible stuff into the very throne of God that nobody else had ever seen before. He beamed back down and God says, Paul, I'm really glad I gave you those incredible spiritual experiences, but it's going to have a tendency to puff you up with arrogance and pride. So I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to stick it to you. So he stuck it to him with this thing called a thorn in the flesh. Everybody familiar with this? Second Corinthians chapter 12. Now, this is my point. In one verse, and you can look this up, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. In the very same verse, he says that uh, there was given to me, because of the abundance of these revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh. We don't know what it was, some type of a physical malady. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan lest I should be exalted above or conceited above measure. In the very same verse, he says it's a gift from God to keep me from getting conceited, and he says it's a messenger of Satan. You can look at that and say, now make up your mind, Paul. Was it a messenger of Satan or was it a gift from God? Come on, can't be both. Oh, yeah? It apparently can be both. But my point is that Paul, as far as where it came from, that was an aside. Yeah, I was a messenger of Satan, and it really hurt. And I asked God to take it away three times, and he didn't. And, and, uh, but on the other hand, it was a gift of God that kept me humble. And God said to him, Paul, my grace sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in your weakness in other words Paul I love you so much that I foresaw you getting arrogant and proud so I allowed the devil to stick it to you but it was a thorn in the flesh so that you could learn to walk in the light even though you were in the darkness of that particular suffering and you can apply this in any way, whether it's suffering, whether you've had a bad diagnosis, whether you've had, uh, you just lost your job, where your boyfriend just dumped you, whatever the situation happens to be, whatever situation you're in right now, don't waste your time in the darkness, but learn. I was invited to a neighborhood board meeting a couple of um, months ago, and um, I was a little bit late. It was about dusk. It was almost dark. And I got to the board meeting, and it was all packed out uh, from a lot of people there. The parking lot was full. So I had to drive about three blocks away, park my car. And so I walk up, and I come to the... Um, uh, I see the field, but there's a steps going up to the field, concrete steps. So I walk up the concrete steps, walk across the field. It's still light. I can see what's going on. I go into the meeting. The police officers are running the meeting. They talk about crime in the neighborhood, and so I, I try to be a good citizen. And I go to the meeting. I come out, and it's dark. As I come out into the darkness, I walk across the lighted parking lot and uh, I walk towards the general direction of my car, but it's totally pitch dark. There's no lights. And as I'm walking across, I get to a certain part of the field and I say to myself, there's a flight of concrete steps coming up here somewhere. I remember that from a couple of hours ago. So I got up and I was going like this because I couldn't see where I was going and then found the step, walked my way down the step and didn't end up cracking my head. Why? Because I was remembering, it was crucial that I remembered while I was walking in the dark what I had previously learned in the light. And that's what walking by faith is all about. There's a verse in the book of uh, Revelation. It says, I counsel to you to buy, B-U-Y, to buy of me gold tried in the fire. And I say sometimes to the Lord, Lord, isn't there any other way we can get the, get the gold except through the fire? But I guess that's the way it comes. And so consequently, we need to be folks who will allow God to give us our inheritance. A couple of years ago, I got in a, uh, a major fight within my organization. How many of you ever fight with other Christians? We got a bunch of dishonest people now. Okay. All right. We have to talk to Waxer about this. But um, sometimes we Christians fight with each other. You know, we're God's kids. And just like any kids, you're going to have fights. And uh, this particular fight I got into was a leader in my organization. I'd worked on something really hard for several months, and he just came in and vetoed what I had done. And I was, I was ticked off because I'd put a lot of hard work into this, and I thought I made the right decision. And isn't that what conflicts are all about? You think you're right, they think they're right. So I thought I was right, and he thought he was right, and so we had a head-to-head, and uh, we were arguing about it. And I said, oh, 
because you're the, you're, you outrank me in the organization and you can veto what I did. You're like the big guy in the schoolyard and I'm the little kid and you're the bully and you can beat me up and there's nothing I can do about it. Is that right? He says, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, Danny, but uh, if that's the way you see it, that's the way you see it. I said, well, that's the way I see it. And he says, well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I said, I don't even agree with that. I disagree with disagreeing with agreeing with you. I don't agree with you on nothing. He said, well, that's your, that's your problem. I said, yeah, I don't know. I said, this is stupid. I, and I got mad. I got up and I slammed the door, walked out, got on a plane from Kona, flew back to Honolulu, and I quit youth with a mission. And I'm talking to my, and I've been with this organization for 20 years, and I was mad. I'm an idiot, I'm a bunch of yahoos around here. You know? What's the matter with these people? I don't recognize a good preacher when they see one. I can't believe this kind of stuff, you know. I'm going to call Campus Crusade tomorrow. They'd love to have me. I walk in full of fire, and I walk in on my wife, and I said, I'm quitting this hokey organization. She goes, What's wrong with you? And I said, I'm not him, I'm calling campus crusade. I'm right. He's wrong. And she says, honey, why don't you go get some sleep? How many of you know sometimes the word of the Lord is just go get some sleep. Go to bed. Go to bed so you don't hurt anything else or any of us. So I went in. I went to bed. The next morning I got up. I took my customary prayer walk. My spirit was calmed down from the sleep. And so the Holy Spirit could get through to me. How many of you know he can't get through when you're raging? Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Danny, are you going to let another human being take away my inheritance that I've given you? Now, he never told me I was right. I said, yeah, but he was wrong and I was right. He never told me. Now, to this day, I think I was right and that guy was wrong. And it makes me mad just thinking about it. But we'll let it go because I have forgiven him at least 70 times 7. But, I just was with the guy about two weeks ago. But uh, I said, hey, by the way, oh, no, we better not bring it up. But we just let it go. And yet, but the bottom line was, are you going to let another human being take away your inheritance? Yeah, but the pastor never had me over for dinner. And the small group leader was an idiot. And they never asked me to do this. And the worship leader plays out of, out of key. And, I kinda, and why don't they recognize that I'm a spiritual giant? And, whoa, whoa, whoa. Is it God that's dropping the boundary lines? Are you, are you, are you in a delightful inheritance? Because the bottom line gets back to God. So if you're going to get mad at somebody, you might as well get mad at God. And, and I suggest you don't do that. <laughs> so be diligent in the darkness to be faithful to what God has called you to do. Number three, last point. Be fixated on eternal security. Be fixated on eternal security. Now, I don't mean by eternal security the argument over Calvinism. That's not my point. Eternal security is this. You have an inheritance here on the earth, a kuleana. You have boundary lines. You have an inheritance. You have a cup. You have a portion. You have what God has given you. 27 personal pronouns in a psalm of 11 verses. That's what you have. And in addition to that, You get to live forever in the kingdom of God. At His right hand are joys forevermore. Now some people say, well, you don't want to be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. That's one of the dumbest things anybody ever said. Let me tell you something. If you're not heavenly minded, you won't be any earthly good. We're not just here to make this world a better place. We're here to rescue people out of thinking that this world is only 70 years long. It's eternity. And Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? So, next couple of verses. I will... Oh, let me see. uh, Verse uh, 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body shall rest in hope. This is two times quoted in the book of Acts to refer to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My body will rest in hope, rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave and you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have eternal life if you're a Christian. And you've got to believe that. Because it's in believing that we're going to live forever that helps us to be able to live for the proper priorities here on the earth. I had a dark night happen to me um, about a year and a half ago. My, one of my very best friends in the whole world died of cancer. And uh, I had a chance to... Well, I was with him for the last couple of weeks. And 
Uh, I went to visit him and, and we had prayed and fasted and cried out to God and bound and loosed and done everything we possibly could. And the Lord helped him survive for eight years of a valiant fight, but he was, he was going down. And there came a time when I just said, I had to let it go. I can't pray for healing anymore. I got to let it go. And then I went in I, and my wife actually came to me. She says, Danny, go in and say goodbye to Kevin. So I went in and I sat down on his bed and he was a mess. His body was emaciated. He was in pain. He was on painkiller drugs. And I said, bro, there's a verse in Hebrews that says that Abraham uh, didn't receive the inheritance, but died in faith having not received his inheritance, but looking for a better city, looking for a better country. I said, I don't know why you didn't receive your healing. We'll find out someday. I said, but this is the good news. And I read the whole 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, which is all about the resurrection of the body. And with very specific terms, it talks about the fact that we are going to get a new body. I am going to look like this for all eternity. Well, maybe that's not a good way to put it. Um, you, you will be able to recognize me in eternity. I hope I come back 25 and surfing pipeline. But um, right now, those two things are not happening. But I'm going to live forever. And we're going to live forever in resurrection bodies, just like the body that Jesus had when he came and appeared to Thomas and his disciples. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see me have. We're going to have physical bodies. So David says here, one of the ways to possess your inheritance is to know that my body is going to rest secure. And that I have an inheritance in the Lord and that you will not abandon me to the grave. If you know Jesus Christ, you are not going to be abandoned to that grave. And you may be in your 80s right now or you may be in your 20s right now. And if you're in your 20s, I want to encourage you to think about the fact that you're going to live forever and therefore live and let God give you your inheritance. So possess your inheritance, number one, by being faithful to what God has called you to do. Number two, to um, be diligent in the darkness if you happen to be in the darkness. If you're not, you probably will go through it. But don't just sit around and moan and groan. No, no, okay, okay, God, I recognize I'm in a tunnel. And I believe I'm going to come out with light on the other side. Help me to walk by faith and to walk by the light of faith in this dark tunnel. And number three, when it's all said and done, we're going to live forever anyhow. And that's the good news. So how many of you want to possess your inheritance? Amen. Lord, I want to pray for all of us that we would say with David, my lot is secure. You've given me my cup. You've assigned me my portion. My boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places and I have a delightful inheritance. I want to pray, Lord, that you would not let human beings steal our inheritance and that we would be able to stand with you to be faithful, to be diligent, and to be fixated. And we pray that you would help us, dear God, to love you with all of our hearts. And we pray that you'd infuse us and inject into our very spiritual bloodstream the joy of the Lord which is our strength. In Jesus' name, amen.